In the last lecture, we introduced the notion of fatigue, where repeated subcritical loading can lead to failure. So we were interested in characterizing this loading, and we introduced cyclic loading that was fully reversed. So we introduced the notion of fully reversed cyclic loading, where the stress amplitude is denoted as sigma AR, and the question is, how many cycles can a component endure before it fails? Now, the way we collect data on this is by doing experiments using a standard test method. So the standard specimen is loaded into a machine and subjected to four-point bending through a custom apparatus so that this interior section here, which is finely polished, will experience only bending, and it will be cyclic, fully reversed now, they do these experiments by first applying a load that is equal to the ultimate strength, and you can't even do one cycle in that. You, what happens is you load up, you reach the ultimate strength, and the sample fails. You dial the load magnitude down a little bit, so you're reducing the bending moment, and then you measure the number of cycles to failure. And I identified two really important basic regimes, and the basic regimes were the finite life regime, where we go all the way up to, say, 10 to the 6 cycles. And then we have the infinite life regime for those materials that experience an endurance limit. Ultimate strength is important. This turnover around 10 to the 3rd cycles is important. And that 10 to the 3rd cycles partitions the low cycle fatigue regime from the high cycle fatigue regime. And this all of this stuff below 10 to the 6th is the finite life regime, and beyond that, we have infinite life. So we need to identify all of these key features on a curve before we can write equations to help us understand how long something will survive. And you have to understand, this is not an accurate methodology. It's really phenomenological. So you get a basic idea of how long something will last, but you are not going to hit it precisely. Now, this endurance limit, it does not exist for all materials. For ferrous materials, you will find an endurance limit. For non-ferrous materials, these are aluminums, there is no endurance limit for these materials. Now, this is a difficult thing to sort of get your arms around, and we mentioned last time that we could relate reverse stress amplitude to the number of cycles to failure using something that we call Baskin's Law. And of course, you would need A and you would need B. These are fitting parameters that you have to find from experiments. Now, it turns out that this is the stress life approach, which is the easiest thing to do. But most people who do fatigue research say the thing that really matters is the strain magnitude because it is localized plastic deformation that shuttles dislocations around and eventually leads to the formation of an initial crack, which then will propagate according to fracture mechanics. So the strain life people realize that locally, let's say you have a large sample and you are exposing it. You think it's a smooth-sided sample, but you are exposing it to cyclic applied load. Loads. You've polished the sides, you begin to cycle it, and you, if you look carefully with a microscope, you might find that there are very, very small scratches that give rise to stress concentrations. So there are these localized stress concentration factors that can locally give rise to plastic deformation. And if you load a sample up and you look locally at the little stress element that's next to a location of stress concentration, in the first cycle, it will load up elastically, then it plastically deforms. You unload, it comes down and goes to here. Second cycle, it goes like this. Unload, you do a number of cycles until it fails. And that stress strain curve can be partitioned into an elastic recoverable deformation and a localized plastic deformation. And the total deformation is the sum of the plastic and the elastic. So the total strain range is going to be the sum of an elastic strain range and a plastic strain range. And this plastic strain range is doing work that's shuttling dislocations around and is really important to the failure of the sample. It becomes really important below 10 to the third cycles of failure. So a number of people who did research in this area realized that the stress life approach wasn't going to work very well. And so they wanted to use a strain life approach where you look at the total strain amplitude, which is partitioned into plastic and elastic parts, and you 
And now instead of talking about cycles to failure, you talk about load reversals. And so they would gather tons and tons of data where they would measure these strains and they would plot the strain amplitude on the y-axis against the reversals to failure, that's 2n, and they found that if you looked at the total plastic strain, there is an elastic and a plastic part to it. As you get to very low cycles to failure, which means very high strain amplitudes, the plastic deformation is large and you get low cycles to failure because of that. But you can fit the elastic and plastic portions and if you do that, you get the total strain and you have a linearized region on log-log plots here that transitions to a linear region here. And this linear region, this lower slope linear region is very much the Baskin's Law region. And this higher slope region, which dominates for large strain amplitudes, has a different slope. And so what you do is you have to now completely reframe the way you're studying this problem. And you're gonna to have to use true stress and true strain, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you realize that the equation for the, the strain amplitude that has to do with the low slope, the slope B, intersects the strain amplitude line with the ratio of the true stress at failure divided by the elastic modulus. And that becomes this curve. For the large plastic deformation region, we have the true strain at failure times the number of reversals raised to a power C. If you add those together, you get that the strain amplitude, the total strain amplitude, is going to be equal to the elastic strain amplitude times 2NF to the B plus this plastic term times 2NF to the C, and these are true stress and true strain. I'll get to that in a moment. They give names to these things. The fatigue ductility coefficient is EF prime. It's the true strain corresponding to one reversal. You load it up and it fails. The fatigue strength coefficient, sigma F prime, is the true stress corresponding to one reversal. And you convert that true stress into an elastic strain by dividing it by the elastic modulus. So you have these two terms, and these two terms forms what's called the Coffin-Manson law. Now, I want to talk a little bit about true stress and true strain so you know where the heck this stuff comes from. So if you were to look at an engineering stress-strain plot, where I have the engineering stress against the engineering strain, we would have a linear region where we would have an elastic modulus that relates them. We have yield, we have cold work, and we have failure. The true stress strain curve, however, would always go up so that we would get an ultimate tensile strength that would be the maximum of this curve. It's always rising. So where do we get that? Well, we define the true stress as the instantaneous load divided by the instantaneous cross-sectional area. What was the engineering stress? The engineering stress is equal to the instantaneous load by the initial cross-sectional area. So how are we going to relate these two? Well, what we realize is that beyond yield, as long as voids aren't showing up, then we're going to have a constant volume process. So the instantaneous area times the instantaneous gauge length is going to be equal to the original area times the original gauge length. So that instantaneous area is equal to A0 times L0 divided by Li. Right, so what does that do for us? So that means that the true stress is going to be equal to the instantaneous load divided by A0 Li over L0. But what is Li? Li is the instantaneous gauge length. Well, Li is just going to be the original gauge length plus some delta L. So it turns out that the true stress is going to be Pi over A0. That's the engineering stress multiplied by if Li is L0 plus delta L and we divide that by L0, we get 1 plus delta L over L. Well, that is equal to the engineering stress times 1 plus the engineering strain. 
So that's how we find the true stress. So what's the definition of strain? The engineering strain is change in length divided by initial gauge length. Well, the incremental true strain is going to be DLI over LI. That's the instantaneous change in length by the instantaneous gauge length. So the true strain then up to any length L is going to be the integral from L naught to L of DL over L, which is just going to be the natural log of L evaluated at L naught L. And this true strain then simply becomes the natural log of Li over L naught. Well, Li is equal to L naught plus delta L. So the true strain is simply equal to the natural log of one plus the engineering strain. So there's easy ways to convert st engineering stress and strain to true stress and strain. And you need the true stress and strain when you're going to be using the Coffin-Manson law if you're looking at total strain amplitude. Now we won't be doing a lot of that, but you need to know where it comes from. The other thing that's important is most of the fatigue life is spent in nucleating. Once the crack forms, then we treat it as a crack growth problem. So when we have a crack growth problem, then we wanna look at the stress intensity factor. If we're loading in mode one, then K we know is some geometric correction factor times sigma root pi A. If we are loading with some cyclic stress amplitude, then the delta K is going to be equal to beta delta sigma times root pi AI. That's an interesting thing. Uh, so then we're going to look at that. We're going to look at fatigue crack growth as a function of different delta sigmas. So let's imagine that we apply three different stress ranges, one, two, and three, where delta sigma three is greater than delta sigma two is greater than delta sigma one. And so if we were to measure the crack length as a function of cycles, you notice that they all start off about the same, but the higher stress level is rising, where the lower stress levels rise a little bit lower. But if you take and plot the slopes of these things, so if you plot dA, dN against delta K, you get a very interesting relationship. We find that we get a power law relationship and there's a threshold delta K below which we won't get any crack growth. Then we get a region of stable crack propagation. It's called region two. And then the crack takes off rapidly and you get failure. So between these crack sizes in here, we get this stable crack growth and we can define a nice relationship between log DADN and log delta K. And that is that DADN is equal to C delta K to the M. And we're gonna just deal with mode one stress intensity factors. These are fitting parameters. C and M are fitting parameters. This is called the Paris Law for Fatigue, named after a person named Paul Paris, not for the city in France. So um, there are some conservative values of these fitting parameters that you can find in the book. We have this idea of DA, DN is equal to C delta K to the M. We know that delta K is going to be equal to beta delta sigma root pi A. And so DA, DN is going to be equal to C beta delta sigma root pi A, all of that stuff raised to the M power. Now, I know what my stress range is, so I'm going to have to take the delta K to the other side of the equation over here, and I'm going to have this C over here as well. I'm gonna have DN, and I'm gonna integrate this from zero to the number of cycles to failure, and I'm gonna go from initial to final crack size. And if I do that, that then allows me to find the number of cycles to failure. All I'm doing is integrating this term right here where I identified the initial crack size. I calculate the final crack size. I got a problem with beta because that geometric correction factor could be changing, but I'll just use the beta that corresponds to the 
an intermediate range for the crack sizes. I know what my delta sigma is, and so I can do this integral. I need the fitting parameters C and M, however, in order for me to do that integral, but it's a relatively straightforward thing to do.